Good morning and welcome to High Life Church, a family where kingdom citizens are born and raised. Our focus is to understand the heart of God, obey his voice and serve our nation as we advance his kingdom. We are on a quest to study his word, steward his presence and apply his revelation in our daily lives. We believe each person is unique, yet we are a body and no member can truly flourish alone. The High Life family is here to help you to bloom and take your place in God's unfolding story. We meet weekly through High Life House Churches, our neighborhood-based congregations. These are smaller groups where we worship, pray, Everything and unpack the Word God of God. Has already said about we share our hearts, fellowship, feast, and grow together. Children are the future of any community and are welcome at High Life House Churches. We teach, train, and love them together as a family. It still takes a village to raise a child. At High Life, we are our brother's keeper and serve the wider body as the Lord leads us. Our Northern Relief Initiative seeks to help widows in Northern Nigeria that have lost their livelihoods as a result of insecurity, supporting them to find fresh hope as they rebuild their livelihoods and their lives. At High Life, we believe there is no substitute for fervent prayer. We pray together daily for the establishment of God's purposes in our lives, our community, and our nation. And you can join us from wherever you are. Every four to six weeks, all our individual house churches meet together at the gathering. It is an opportunity to celebrate together, enjoy corporate worship, and stay connected across our wider community. High Life Church is a part of High Life World. Connect with us at www.highlifechurch.com to explore all that the High Life has to offer. Welcome to High Life. Hello everyone, um, we're here again. And um, today we will be talking about the dispensation of sons. Um, the subtopic for that is sons of God, um, who, how, and why. So that's what we'll be talking today. That's what we'll be talking about today, sorry. Um, and yeah, let's just quickly say a prayer to get started. Um, Father Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to spend time in your presence. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We know you're already here, so we acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge your presence. We ask that you take full control of this session. We ask that you take the words, scriptures being shared, and wherever anyone is listening to this, that these words will permeate their hearts, and you would do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So, we're getting start. We get started, jump straight into it. And um, like I said, talking about the dispensation of sons, with a subtopic, sons of God, who, how, and why. And yeah, so um, the first thing I'd like us to talk about is, I, I, actually, primarily, I want to cover three things in, in this session. First thing is, who are sons of God, um, how sons of God, and why sons of God. All of this, I believe, should dovetail into understanding the dispensation of sons. So we'll start off by talking about who is a son of God. Um, and simply stated, a son of God is one that is led by the, by the Spirit of God. And that comes from Romans 8 um, verse 14. And just so you know, most of my scriptural references will be coming from Green's Literal Translation. That's the LITV. Um, so for those that want to follow um, please feel free to use that. And I believe um, we'll be seeing that coming on screen whilst I'm talking. Um, so like I said, simply stated, a son of God is one that is led by the Spirit of God. Um, and that comes from Romans 8. Um, Romans 8 is so pivotal into understanding who, how, and why. Because um, Romans 8, Paul, Paul's letter to the church in Rome um, was focused on especially that particular chapter, focused on helping people identify what their identity was and how that identity was linked to just so many things as to who they were, what they were meant to be doing, why it was that way, and all the things that surround um, sonship and its um, dispensation. So um, we started with that. Um, a son of God is someone who is led by the Spirit of God, right? As, in fact, the scripture says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, um, which, which purports that some people might be led and some people might not be led. And like I said, he wasn't talking to the Gentiles. He wasn't talking to people who didn't know Christ. This was a letter written to those that were, had given their lives, had responded to the love of Christ and were walking on that journey of discipleship. 
Um, and with that statement, there are a couple of things that need to be highlighted, and I think that should be obvious, but I think it's worth mentioning, is um, being a son of God has nothing to do with your gender, right? There's no gender bias of any sort. The Son of God is an identity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and um, us being sons of God is so important that we understand why we need to walk in that and what is important. So I just wanted to clear that up very quickly right at the onset, that there is no gender bias to um, sonship and to being a son of God. Um, that is clear. Um, there are a couple of other things about who sons of God are. Sons of God are either infantile or they are matured. And what does that mean? Um, sons of God as infants. We need to go to another letter by Paul, um, written to the church in Galatia, and that is Galatians 3, 26 to 29. And just um, to drop a point here quickly, I mean, even though we're using scriptural references, highlighting chapters and verses, we must understand the way these letters were written. There's a flow to all Paul was saying, especially in Galatians, because he speaks of, sons of God being infants, and he defines what that means when you respond to the love of Christ. Um, so that's Galatians 3, verses 26 to 29. And I read, um, like I said, I'm reading from LITV, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. There cannot be Jew nor Greek. There is no slave nor free man. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are of Christ, then you are a seed of Abraham, and even as according to promise. So literally what this is telling us is about the infant nature. When you come to Christ, when you respond to Christ, it talks about your identity, your race. There's nothing like that. There's no race. There's no skin color. Um, there's no gender. Um, there's no covenant, existing covenant, whether you be of the circumcised or of the uncircumcised, that's Jew or Gentile. He's saying that all those definitions, all those categories do not apply to sons of God completely. And when you respond to Christ, you already start being a son of God. But here's the key. You're an infant. And Paul now explains further the difference between infants and mature ones. And the scripture for that, sons of God as matured ones, is Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 2. And that reads, and I read, but I say, over so long a time, the heir is an infant. He being Lord of all, does not differ from a slave, but is under guardians and housemasters until the term set before by the father. And like I said, here Paul contrasts what it means to be a son of God that is an infant, because all sons of God, all sons of God, all sons of God are heirs, right? And but Paul continuing in his letter from Galatians 3 to Galatians 4, needed to point out that, yes, because you're a son of God and you're in the kingdom and you've accepted Christ and you've accepted him by faith and you're baptized and you're an heir, there's still a process of maturation that needs to happen. Christ called discipleship, right, um, to disciple nations. That needs to happen. And he says, even though you believe in Christ and you have access to all these things and it's your right, until you mature, you cannot access any of those things. So, Galatians 4, 1 to 2 highlights that for us, lets us know that very quickly, that yes, you've accepted him, you're in the kingdom, but you're still an infant. Though you're an heir, you're still an infant, and if you do not mature, there'll be no difference between you and the slave. That is the one bound, that is the one in bondage, which is very interesting. So it was using um, the hierarchy in a family, a wealthy family or a, a noble family to depict what it meant to be a son of God who's an heir, but because you're immature, you can't access and utilize all the things that are yours by, by, by right of birth. Um, and that also applies to us as those that are believing in Christ Jesus and being discipled in him. That maturity is key um, for sons of God. Um, the next point here on this particular point about who is a son of God is I have this cent central thesis for this particular question, who is a son of God? And I hope this particular statement I'm about to read depicts that and sorry, captures that um, appropriately. And this is what it is. The beloved son of God, that is sonship, is a pivotal identity of Yeshua, that is Jesus, the Christ, that every disciple child of God is to be transformed into, continually conformed into and operate from. I'd read that again. The beloved son of God is a pivotal identity of Yeshua, the Christ, that every disciple child of God is to be transformed into, continually conformed into 
and operate from. I would like to, and I'm sure we're going to have you have that up on your screen so you can see it again, but I want to read it again, right? Just for emphasis. The beloved son of God, that is sonship, is a pivotal identity of Yeshua the Christ that every discipled child of God is to be transformed into, continually conformed into, and that child should operate from. And that is who a son of God is. So like I said, scripture tells us in Romans 8, 14, which, we, which I read earlier on, and I think you have open in your Bible, is that that is what it means to be a son of God, right? To be led by the Spirit of God. Now, the fullness of what a son is, is what we've just read now. A son of God, us as sons of God, is based on the son of God, that is Christ himself. He is the beloved son of God. That is what was said, that is what the father declared um, as he rose out after being baptized by John the Baptist, was that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that scripture is so popular, you know, we all love it. We highlight it in baptism, we highlight it when we're talking about Christ. But what is very interesting about that is it was also part of his activation for manifestation, you know, and that is very important. And we'll talk about that um, later on as we proceed um, through this. Um, a couple of things worth noting about this identity, about the identity of being a son of God. A couple of things worth noting. And um, I just have seven key elements I wanted to point out, which are worth mentioning. Um, you're going to have that up on your screen also, so you can follow. There are quite a number of verses um, that are linked to this, and we don't have the time to go, in through, go into all the verses. So I recommend that the slides will be passed around and the, the PDF file will be shared for those that are interested in studying this more. And I do encourage everyone to go through this in their own time with this video, without this video, just ask the Holy Spirit to shed more light on what we're talking about, who is a son of God and how you're a son of God and whether you're mature or um, immature, which is an instrumental for the dispensation that we're in and for the dispensation of sons. Um, so the seven elements I want to highlight, um, like I said, there's not enough time to go into all of it. So I'm just going to mention one or, one or two verses while I talk about each element. So I'll, I'll run through the list of the seven elements of an identity of a son of God. The first is this, elements of the identity of a son of God. The first one is the kingdom of God, right? Right. That is something that is in our hearts. Our hearts is shaped around the kingdom of God. The second thing is royalty. I know that's very popular because, you know, we all talk about being royal priesthoods, which brings to the third element, which is priesthood. Um, and those are, they, those are closely linked in the identity of the Son of God. Um, um, just a note there, that we declare that we're royal priests does not negate the fact that there are two separate elements. The reason why they are conjoined and we talk about being royal priests is the royalty, our royalty and our priesthood are linked in the identity of being sons of God. But that's something I'll just briefly mention and I think the sessions being compiled where we'll be able to go into this in more detail to bring better understanding. Um, the fourth element of the identity of the Son of God is the blood of the Lamb. And I know that's very popular with everyone. The fifth one is, um, the fifth element is the nation you are. Um, the sixth element of the identity of a Son of God is that you're a house and a temple of God. That's also pretty instrumental. And the seventh element of the identity of a Son of God is stewardship. Um, like I said, um, this is not trying to encapsulate everything, but this is me highlighting seven elements, seven key elements of our identities as, as sons of God. Um, on the kingdom of God, I just want to spend a couple of minutes there. Um, we've got a whole bunch of verses, Matthew 6, 33, Mark 1, 14 to 15, Mark 4, 11, Luke 7, 28, Luke 17, 20 to 21, Matthew 13, 10 to 17, Luke 19, 11 to 27. So I'm only going to read those scriptures with that particular one, but we're going to have... Um, the slide on the screen so you'd be able to look at it yourself, pause it, write down the scriptures. You get the slides so if you want to study more in line with what we're saying. But regarding the element of the kingdom of God, I think one scripture I want to highlight would be Matthew 13. Um, in particular, what is called or what has been categorized as the parable of the sower. And, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is that's just that parable is such a key parable and should be a key parable and key revelations are embedded in that parable for every child of God. And I love the way Christ says it, you know, in that parable, we're not going to read everything now because um, there's not enough time um, to go through um, a lot of that. But um, one of the things I want to highlight there is how 
you know, Jesus shared the parable um, of the sower, he spoke about the scenarios of the sower sowing the seeds into the ground. And, you know, it's not the way we sow now. In those days, it used to be a chunk. Um, the, the, the farmer, the sower, would have a bag around his waist. That's the way they used to, um, they used to sow those days. They'd have a pouch of some sort, either holding it or around their waist or slung around their shoulders where they dip their hands into and generously throw the seeds into the ground in their field and to be sown. And that is the imagery that comes with that. But that particular parable is how the seeds were sown. So they were generously sown. And Jesus tells us about the types of earth, you know, the one that was sown by the, that was sown by the stony side, the one that was sown um, on the ground, which had a bit of earth, the one that was sown into the soil where there were thorns that grew up with it. And the final one was the good soil. I bring that up in terms of the kingdom of God because that parable actually highlights the importance of our heart. The, the, the key premise for that parable, which Jesus actually explains himself later on to the disciples when they go, when they question him, like, why do you speak to people in parables? What does this mean? And he explains why. But then he goes on to define how whoever understands this parable will understand all parables. And a, a point here is it's not just parables in the Bible. It's the parables of life. So in every era, in every season, if you understand this parable, if you understand the revelation in this parable about the kingdom of God and its relationship to your heart, then you'd understand every parable in, in there. So um, the kingdom of God has to do with your heart, which is tied to one of the elements, which is one of the elements of the identity of a son of God. Um, so Jesus highlights how every type of soil there is the heart. But he says something. He says, and the word of the kingdom. So he, he highlights how the seed sown is the word of the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Very important. Very subtle point there made, but it's extremely important. So he talks about how our, our, our hearts are tied to the kingdom of God. That is where he deposits things. That is where he sows his word, right? It's not just a logical um, thing that is going on. So that's one element um, of the identity of the son of God. Um, like I said, we don't have enough time to go into it because there's so much in there. So if you get the chance, the scriptures, please go through them. Ask the Holy Spirit to shed more light so he can also explain in ways that you'd understand in addition to what we're talking about here. And the second element here is the element of royalty. And this is so important because, you know, we all love this. Everybody says, I'm a king, you know, I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. We've got people in society claiming themselves as kings. We've got you know, people in, in investment, in finance, in the financial sector, calling themselves kings. We've got kings of tech. We've got kings in almost every sphere where everyone sees themselves as royalty or queens um, as, um, as the gender uh, apply or not apply according to what's happening all around the world. Um, but yeah, what is so important here is the element of the identity of a son of God as royalty, whether you, you see yourself as a queen or a king. Um, and the verses here are, I just have, two portions of scripture, Genesis 14, 17 to 20, and then Psalms 110, 1 to 7. And Genesis 14, 17 to 20 is pretty popular. That has to do with Abraham. And when he meets the, the king of Salem, who happens to be of the order of Melchizedek simultaneously, occupying a role of both kingship and priesthood. Um, it has been said and is strongly believed that that was a type of Christ appearing to him, but in, in, it was a symbol of Christ, it was a type of Christ. But also we've got Psalms 110, 1 to 7. Psalms 110, 1 to 7 is such an amazing scripture um, because um, I use the, these two scriptures are so important to royalty because we've got Abraham, that is before the law is given in the old covenant, before the old covenant is instituted. We've got Abraham um, encountering a king and a priest, that is a royal priest. And um, how that royal priest acknowledges him as Abraham of the Most High God. Basically reiterating the identity and the things God had been saying to him. And that was important. It's important to understand the royalty. The other element is David and this phenomenal, and this phenomenal, what's the word I'm looking for? This phenomenal depiction of the vision that he had. You know, the vision that he had of seeing his Lord seated next to the Lord. And I really, really love Psalms 110. It's, it's, it's just amazing because this is a point in time where we see David goes, or he, whether it's a trance, whether it's a physical occurrence where he's translated into heaven, we don't know. But we know he says he sees the Lord seated next to the Lord. 
And Psalms 110 is such a powerful scripture because it talks about his kingship, but he also talks about, Psalm 110 talks about how his royalty, how the royalty of the Lord um, is, um, is, 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 is spoken of there. Also, it delves still into Christ being of the order of Melchizedek, which leads to the third element of the identity of the Son of God, which is priesthood. Um, and then again, we also have the same scriptures. Like I said, um, we have the scriptures with us. But we begin to see how, and by the way, all these elements are elements that the Son of God, Yeshua, the Christ, also exhibits, right? In his identity as the Son of God, Christ exhibits himself as the kingdom of God. He ex exhibits himself as royalty. He exhibits himself as a priest, which we know of the order of Melchizedek. Of course, we also know he exhibits himself as the lamb and the blood of the lamb, which was essential. Um, he also exhibits himself as a nation. Um, he exhibits himself as the temple of God. And some people are like, oh, but how is Christ the temple? Actually, there's reference that everything that was seen that is a shadow of the temple, according to scripture and according to what John saw in Revelation, reveals that Christ actually is the temple of which all temples were built after. So, um, and that is such a big topic. We don't have enough time to look at that here. But um, for those that are interested, houses and temples, you know, he talked, it's spoken a lot about in Revelation, the vision of um, John the Apostle when he sees Christ descend and he says he is the temple of God. Um, but also, Christ also exhibits stewardship. So all the elements of our identity as a son of God are based on the elements of Christ as the son of God. So there is nothing here that is outside the identity of the son of God, Jesus Christ. So, so yes, so, um, so yeah, that was royalty, priesthood. Um, go through number four, blood of the lamb, right? Yeah, this is such an amazing topic. You know, um, the scriptures here are 1 John 2, 24, 1 John 2, 27 to 28, 1 John 4, 13. And the blood of the lamb <laughs> is such a tender topic to most Christians. Um, it's understanding, understanding of the sacrifice of Christ, um, understanding of his flesh, which was part of the sacrifice, and understanding his blood, which was also part of that sacrifice. And they're just, there's just a whole bunch of things, the blood, the flesh, and the lamb itself. Um, but um, the blood of the lamb is such a key thing. Um, and I'm not just talking about oh, using it for protection, or for healing, or for many of the things we tap into for it, which it does have power in it. But I'm talking about something that is so fundamental to our identity as sons of God. The blood of the lamb is so fundamental to that. And by the way, I'm also not talking about how the blood of the Lamb washes us of our sin and how we come into Christ through the blood of the Lamb. That's not what I'm talking about. All those things are true. But there is something about the element of the blood of the Lamb in our identity as sons of God. And that is something that we really need to get a revelation about. You know, to understand the blood of the Lamb, you need to understand how pivotal it is. Not just for the sacrificial purpose of cleansing, protection, healing, and all the other things we use it for, or salvation, but that it is so fundamental to our identity that Christ, remember Christ was slain before the foundations of the earth. That is a scripture in Revelation 13, 8 or 6. Please don't quote me on that. I can't really remember that, but it's in Revelation. Um, and he was slain before the foundations of the earth. So that means before earth was created, he was already slain in the spiritual realm. So when you begin to associate the blood of the lamb to only the things that affect you and how we benefit on it from it, that is such... Um, an understatement of the capacity of what it is and why he did it and why the blood is so important to your identity. Um, and I know we'll probably need to talk about that some more, but we just can't do that now. Um, but like I said, um, High Life material is being, is being um, um, collated, material is being developed to help us understand these important truths and revelation about who we are, our identity, our dispensation as sons, and what it is we're meant to be doing. Um, on this earth. So the next element I'll quickly touch on is number five, that is how each individual is a nation. You know, there's something about your identity as a son of God that you must understand that makes you a nation. And you know, we're so used to the geographical definition, definition based on boundaries, based on how we define boundaries now. So um, I'd like to just burst that bubble for a second, suspend that thinking for a second, and you need to understand how the earth was. You know, science tells us that all lands, I mean, you don't even need to be a scientist. You don't need to be an archaeologist. You don't need to be a geologist. You don't need to be any of those things. All you have to do is just look at the map of the world. If you look at some of the ancient maps and how they were, and, and what's it called? Oh, is it cartographers? I think the people that develop maps. 
sorry again, I forget. You know, I need to get, I think they're cartographers if I'm not wrong, but I might be wrong. So please, I stand to be corrected by anyone <laughs> watching this. But, you know, the way the maps were designed, you see how closely knit they were before. And if you look at the map today, you can see it's all like pieces of a puzzle that you can easily tell still fits together. Um, Madagascar, Europe, the Horn of Africa fitting into the Middle East, um, just even the way it fits into South America. You can actually bring all of it together and see that it was actually a piece of land. Over time, and I really believe this is one of my theories, right? Over time, because of the effects of sin as time progressed, science tells us that the tectonic plates shifted and they are still shifting, right? So things have been moving and that's why the earth and what we call continents, what we call countries have been formed. Yes, people migrated, but you need to understand. And I say that because so we can detach ourselves from that meaning, which is a fact, but it's not necessarily the complete truth. And there are two different things there. We must understand the complete truth that Every individual God sees as a nation. I mean, this is something God says saying to Abraham, said it to Isaac, said it to Jacob, said it to the sons. You know, when Jacob was blessing the 12 tribes of Israel, he addressed them as a nation each. He addressed them as a nation each, you know, from Reuben to Simeon to Naphtali to Gad to Dan to Benjamin to Yosef, you know to um, even to Manasseh, Ephraim, you know, to all these guys, you know, he addressed each individual as a nation, right? So it's important that that is actually a spiritual concept that has been instituted by the Lord. Yes, we have nations now, but he sees each person. There's a part of your identity that is a nation. And that is something that we really need to subscribe to and get understanding on. Um, scriptures are Genesis 17, 1 to 5, Nehemiah 9, 6 to 8. Um, yeah, so the next element... Number six, on the elements of the identity of a son of God is houses and temples of God. And this is a very, very big deal <laughs> that each of us is a house and temple of God. Paul talks about this a lot. And um, we've got, I mean, the first mention of this is in Genesis 28. Um, when Jacob has that dream, you know, I don't call Jacob a supplanter, but I'll not go into that right now. But um Jacob had the dream as he fled because he was afraid of what he had done. And, you know, he has the dream of Bethel, you know, Bethel. And what that means is he had a dream where he was able to see, a, he was given access to a portal. He was able to transcend time of the present, what was going on physically, where he was at, even though there was nothing there. God gave him a word that tapped into the spiritual realm where he was able to see something that would happen later. Because what's interesting is where... Jacob slept, later on became Bethel. So those that were writing, it turned it to be Bethel. So it says, the Bible tells us in Genesis 28 that that place, that city was originally called Luz, right? So God gave a vision about the house of God and something he was going to do thousands, millennia later, millennia later. So, you know, it's also important. Paul gives us understanding. Hebrews, we have this in Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, about what the house and the temple of God. Paul talks about how we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, Right? And that revelation itself is something that people really need to spend a lot of time understanding as part, as part of your identity. You're a temple and you're a house of God. So fantastic. Yeah, so that's the important thing about the element of houses and temples of God, right? Paul tells us that we're temples of the Holy Spirit. He also talks about how each of us is a brick being built up as the house of God, right? So, um, like I said, you know, there's a lot of material um, you know, there's a lot of material about that. We have a lot of material about that already. And, you know, you can request some of this material and a lot of stuff is being updated. And the final element of the identity of a son of God is stewardship. And this is so key. And, you know, we've got Luke 16, 1 to 17. That's a whole parable there. But most importantly, part of your identity as a son of God is you are a steward, right? You are a steward. And that's so important. You're stewarding the things of God. You're stewarding the spiritual realm. You're stewarding the physical realm. You're a steward. And we have to be good stewards. So um, those are the key things I wanted to highlight on who a son of God is. And yes, we'll be moving on to the next slide now, which is how do we become sons of God? How do we become sons of God? Um, simple, you know. And I'm talking to people that have, I believe the people that are listening to this are people that have really responded to the love of Christ. Um, you've submitted to the process, you've confessed your sins, and you've repented. Repenting here, not just with your words. Repenting here mean, be, meaning 
turning away from what you were doing and looking to a new direction in Christ. So I believe the people listening are people that have done that. And if you haven't done that, I encourage you now to just take a couple of seconds and just accept our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into your heart. Understand he loves you so much. He loved you even while you didn't even know he loved you. Man, he's a pretty good lover, I have to say. He really, really loves us intensely. So you don't have anything to lose. You have a lot to gain. But I'm not going to highlight benefits, pros versus cons here, because this is not a negotiation. But if you feel impressed in your heart that you want to access the fullness of Christ and his love, I encourage you to accept Christ right now as your Lord and Savior, um, to turn away from what it is you've been doing and what it is you're doing and ask him to come into your heart. You can say it wherever you are right now, Lord Jesus, I want to accept you into my heart. I ask for forgiveness of all my sins and I repent and I turn away from the way I was, the life I used to live. I ask you to take control of my life now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so how do we become sons of God? Simply put, it's, it's simple. The simplest way to describe this, I just have a sentence here I want to read. To become a son of God is the process of being transformed into his image. That is the image of the son of God from glory to glory on the journey of discipleship. And that literally is from 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. Um, let me, let me, yeah, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. I'll read that in a second, but I just wanted to make a couple of points. I wanted to make a whole bunch of points, but... I want to mention a, uh, another key point here, which is sons of God are modeled after Jesus Christ in his identity as the son of God. So sons of God are modeled after Jesus Christ in his identity, in his title as the son of God, and in wearing his mantle of sonship as the beloved son of God. So we become sons of God by being modeled after Jesus Christ in his identity, in his title as the son of God, and wearing his mantle of sonship as the beloved son of God. Simply put, that's how we become sons. Pack, turning that from revelation into practicality is the process of the journey of discipleship, which is such a key thing. Um, it's so, so important. You know, many people have accepted Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. They're reading tons of books. They, you know, they're being awoken spiritually. Woke, woke. Yeah. They're being awoken spiritually. They're prophesying. You know, they're learning how to prophesy. They're having dreams. All these things are fantastic. But all of that is to encourage you to draw closer to the Lord. It's something I strongly believe in and I always share this a lot. Every dream, every prophecy, every revelation, every word of God written in scripture, every word of God orally given to you, confirmed, that is the Holy Spirit, every divine encounter you have, whether in heaven, a trance, physically, angels appearing, angelic encounters, everything that God does in our lives is to draw us closer to him. Fundamentally, there is nothing that God does that is not geared towards drawing us close to him. And in drawing close to him, that means you're being transformed. That means you're going on a journey of discipleship. Let me just quickly throw this in here. There's something that we've been talking about in a couple of groups that we're in. Shout out, Rocks the Massive crew. You know, I cannot not mention your guys, right? But, um, you know, there's something we've been talking a lot about, you know, in, <laughs> and I know I'm going to get a lot of stick for that, but hey, Right. There's something that um, we've been talking a lot about, and that is the journey of discipleship being cyclical in nature. And I'll just quickly mention this here, and I believe stuff is being developed to that effect to help us understand this and walk on this journey. And that is you coming as a child of God, for those of you who just gave your lives and those of you who are already children of God and walking with him, you coming at the point of being a child of God. That journey takes you to becoming a follower of Christ. From then on, you're meant to progress into the element in this journey of being a disciple of Christ, right? Where you're being discipled. That is, you're being disciplined, right? You're being disciplined in the things of the Spirit, in the things of God. Sometimes it might seem restrictive, but that is to develop a culture and a habit in you. Then from being a disciple, you go on to that journey where you learn to become a friend of God. Jesus talks about it where he says to the disciples that you're no longer slaves, that you're friends, that you are my friends, referring to the disciples. What's sweet is, a quick nugget here, Jesus referred to Judas as a friend when he came to the Garden of Gethsemane to betray him, right? Jesus saw Judas as a friend, right? So you go on to the path of the journey of discipleship where you're a friend. Then from there, from friend, you learn what it means to become a lover. You begin to tap into the love of Christ, to understand the love of God, to see Christ as the lover based on his love. And you progress on if you still want and are willing 
So it gets onto the part of the journey of discipleship where you become the adopted. Not because that's the first time the Lord is adopting you, but because you begin to tap into the revelation of adoption, the spirit of adoption. So you learn that you are an adopted one. From there, we move on to becoming sons of God, trying to be like him, then manifesting as sons of God like him. Then you can go even deeper on the journey of discipleship to being sons of God as him, where you be him, according to 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are we in this world. And then after that, you can even move forward with the dispensation of sons where you begin to manifest as him. So I think it's just important to mention that part as the process of discipleship. Um, and, you know, I was going to talk about the backstory, the first Adam and the last Adam, but um, a lot of that is in the notes and the scriptures there. And what that simply means on becoming sons of God is one of the key things about Adam is Adam did not fulfill his purpose. He was perfect, but he was immature. He was an immature son of God, yet he was physically perfect, spiritually perfect, so to speak. But God designed the Garden of Eden, both as a physical and a spiritual place, where there was alignment, it was like a portal, where there was alignment in the spirit and in the physical, where he was meant to mature into a mature son of God. And the test and the process of that was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is why they were there. And he did not mature. So I'm not going to go into a lot of that. But then we have the last Adam who comes, comes in flesh, fulfills what Adam, the first Adam was meant to do, um, but couldn't do it properly. Um, like I said, there'll be more teachings about that to help us gain more understanding. You know, one of the reasons why we're doing a lot of this and a lot of this, we're taking time to explain a lot of these things. We've been talking about the distinctions of character, the distinction of presence, the distinction of government is understanding is required. I mean, if you go through Matthew 13, when Jesus talks about the parable, the reason why the devil could steal the word of the kingdom, it says that there was no understanding, right? There was no understanding. The reason why the seed that matured and grew up quickly and its roots were not deep enough, guess what? There was no maturity. I hope we're seeing a pattern here. The reason why the seed that was sown and it was choked by thorns, guess what? there was no proper focus. They were not properly disciplined. They were not properly discipled also. Because of a lack of focus, the carelessness allowed everything else to choke it and obviously the good heart. So um, really emphasizing a lot of this journey of discipleship as the pathway to becoming sons of God. And we're going to talk about it some more. Um, so the scripture I was mentioning, I said I wanted to quickly read, was um, 2 Corinthians three seventeen to 18, LITV. Um, and the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But we all with our face having been unveiled, having beheld the glory of the Lord in a mirror, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory as from the Lord Spirit. And you know, a lot of times people talk about 2 Corinthians 3.17, oh, there's freedom in the Spirit. And you're right, there is freedom in the Spirit. Where the Spirit is, there's liberty, there's freedom. Right? I was going to mention someone's name now, but I think I shouldn't. But yeah, there's freedom in the spirit, you know. Um, and But there's a purpose to the freedom in the spirit. What is the purpose to the freedom in the spirit? Second Corinthians 3, 17 to 18, 18 tells us the purpose to the freedom. Because remember, this letter, Paul was already talking about the old dispensation. The old dispensation of Moses where his face shone and where there was glory in that face. So much so he had to cover the glory. The glory of the Lord physically affected Moses. And Paul was trying to say, listen, that dispensation was glorious and yet it faded. The dispensation you're in now, you're going from glory to glory. It's increasing. I have a question here. Can we all safely say that we're maturing in Christ where the glory of the Lord is increasing from glory to glory in our transformation into his image as the Son of God? And that's a personal question everyone has to answer in their hearts. Everybody has to answer it, right? So the purpose of the liberty and freedom in the spirit is to be transformed into the image of Christ. That is why we have liberty in the spirit. It's not so that you can, you know, go on, uh, go on and, and, and <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's not that so that you can go on an entire episode of speaking in tongues nonstop for three hours or you know, feeling like you're so scholastic and coming up with fantastic Hebrew-Greek. I'm laughing at myself because 
you know, I kind of do that when I'm reading and all. So, yeah, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to be transformed into the image of the Son of God. So, um, what else? What other point? Another thing is this, right? So that we understand that this was a, a theme that, that Paul was trying to address. Romans 8, 29. It reads, I'm reading from the LITV. Because whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. For him to be the firstborn among many brethren. So here is Paul talking about one of the things the father was thinking about. What was the father thinking about? The father was thinking that the reason why he made, he, he gave us a predestination was so that we could be shaped into the image of his son. So that, check this out, his son, Christ, our redeemer, our lover, you know, the king of kings, would be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Can you see that? Basically, the whole point is there are meant to be many people that look like the father and Christ so that Christ will be the firstborn. He's our big bro. Do you understand? He's meant to be our big. That it was part of the plan. Um, and finally, the final point here is true sonship is the son of God being formed in one spirit, soul, and body. And as the son of God is formed in our tripart being, as in our spirit, soul, and body, um, all of creation responds to his forming in us. I repeat, all of creation responds to his forming in us. Creation responds to the extent of the image of Yeshua, the Christ, that we have been transformed into. This is the access to our full inheritance. So um, that was, I hope I gave some more insight on how we become sons of God there. And right now, I would like us to take a moment to pause. And um, I know some people are going to be excited by this and some people will not be too excited. But there's some discussion points I'd like us to have a look at, just based on some of the things that have been said. Um, In all our groups there, um, whatever groups and however you're listening to this, um, I'd like us to go through some discussion points. um, um, The slide, the points will be put on the screen so that um, we can see them. But these points, I want us to go through these points and I want us to spend some time engaging with one another. You know, what I have here is three key points and under each point there are a couple of questions. Simple questions, but questions that are meant to trigger certain perspectives and to trigger thoughts in us, in our hearts, so that we see where we're at, we look into our own hearts and see where we're at, see where we're heading to and where we should be thinking to head to. So there'll be a pause now, So, um, and I'll come back to you in a few minutes. I'd like us to take about 10 minutes to look into these things um, as much as possible and go around the groups, our groups, and um, discuss it. Thank you, and I'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone. Great to have everyone back. I hope the discussions were pretty good. I hope they were productive. Um, I assume that we got everyone in the groups to speak um, and to share their points of view. So I hope that was a fantastic session. And the goal of that is just to, in it, to trigger certain things, like I said earlier on, and to get us to discuss these things, to stir up these things um, in our hearts and know exactly what is going on and our understanding. Most importantly, is to stir up our understanding of um, the Word of God. So the final thing I'd like to address today is why must we become sons of God? And I think um, that's the final element of what I, that's the final thing I want to address today um, under the dispensations of sons, sons of God, who, how, and why, is why must we become sons of God? You know, why is it imperative that we mature into sonship? Why is it so, so, so crucial for the last days that sons of God emerge? You understand? Why is that imperative? What does sonship have to do with the unfolding of biblical prophecy in the end of days, with the Antichrist, with everything going on? What is it about what we're experiencing across the whole earth that requires sons of God, that requires us to mature as sons of God? Okay, so that's really what I want to talk about here now. So um, there are a couple of verses we look at. We can look at all of it. As I said, we share the slides and everything. Um, the first point I want to make here is why must we become sons of God? The first point is the release. The reason why is it is for the release of all of creation from the slavery of corruption for Christ's inheritance. The reason why we must mature as sons of God in these days and in these last days is we are to release all of creation from the slavery of corruption for Christ to inherit. Please notice there is an emphasis on all of creation, a major emphasis. It's not just human beings. It's not just our family. It's not just our nations. It's not just the impoverished. It's not just the poor in body, poor in spirit. It's not just those that are being oppressed. No, all of creation. And when we look at all of creation, you always have to go back to Genesis 1 and 2. Everything he created in the heavenly realms, in, in space, basically everything that has been created by God, Christ needs to inherit. And that is mind-boggling because what we've been told, whether overtly, whether overtly or you understand, we've just assumed those or we've arrived at these conclusions and these assumptions is, you know, and I've heard all kinds of things. Oh, souls are the currency of heaven. I'm like, like really? I understand the point being made, but we really need to be careful because these assumptions and these illustrations we use to make points become perspectives that people are believing, and they're inaccurate. Simply stated, they're inaccurate, right? Christ needs to inherit all that he created. He created everything, and he wants to inherit everything. So if you focus on some things, what happens to the other parts of creation? What, what, what becomes of it? He loses it? That's not the plan. That was never the plan. The plan is everything that was made was made through him, for him, for him to rule over and for him to inherit. So um, based on that, I repeat that the reason why we must become sons of God is to release all of creation from the slavery of corruption for Christ's inheritance. Um, experiencing sonship helps us understand headship and heirship. I repeat. Sonship allows you to understand what it means to be the head over things and to be a heir, right? Very important. Those two key things, you know, he that is the head of it, not only does he own it, he's also to inherit it. Do you understand? And there's something that happens. And the reason why the inheritance and all of that comes of, obviously is because of the sin of disobedience and how all of that came through, you know, but headship and heirship, very important. So I repeat that again, this point before we go to Romans 8, 19 to 22. Um, experiencing sonship helps me understand headship and heirship with the aim of experiencing and living out headship and heirship for the kingdom of God. And I hope, I think that, I believe that will be put on the screen for us to see that, right? And if we want, we can pause for just five seconds, emphasis five seconds, to let that sink in. Experiencing sonship helps me understand headship and heirship with the aim of experiencing and living out headship and heirship for the kingdom 
of God. Um, and we quickly go to the scripture. The scripture is Romans 8 that we have here. Romans 8, 19 to 22, LITV, Green's Literal Translation. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was not willingly subjected to vanity, but through him subjecting it on hope that also the creation will be freed from the slavery of corruption to the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that all creation groans together and travails together until now. And yes, so phenomenal scripture there and highlights that just just the biblical foundation for what I've just said. Um, there is a school of thought that states what is mentioned here in Romans 8 focuses on after resurrection of the body, right? Where everything will be released um, and everything will be released into the glory. There's a school of thought that says that. And that school of thought states that that is when this will happen. And that is partly correct. It's partly true. It's correct in the sense that it, there's a dimension of releasing creation from the slavery of corruption that happens after Christ resurrects everyone and Christ returns and all of that and happens in the end times, right? There's an element and that is the bodies will be resurrected and there's a glory that creation is, is, released, to, is released into and that is correct. But it is not something we are to just look forward to. It's something that we as sons of God can begin to release creation into now. I mean, I love it the way John puts it in John 17 verse 3. And he says, you know, because many times, for example, to illustrate this, people talk about eternal life, eternal life. And we make it sound or seem sometimes eternal life is something that we are going to. We make it seem eternal life is a location in heaven. We make it seem eternal life is something I would live later. But Christ categorically states what eternal life is. This is eternal life, that you may know the Father and the Son whom he sent, right? That is it. This present tense, right? This is it now. Right? And in John 17, most people call it the high priestly prayer. I just call it Jesus talking to his father. Right? Um, he illustrates that point that eternal life starts from now. You begin to experience and live out eternal life from now. If you mature enough, you begin to live it out now, which means you can release creation. You begin to prepare Christ for his inheritance. Romans 8 talks about it, that we're joint heirs, right? Co-heirs, right? Why are you co-heirs with someone if it's just about them? Because he also needs you to do your part. That is to mature into sonship and release um, creation. So that's the fundamental reason why we must become sons of God, to release all of creation. And we've got scriptures here, John 1, 3, Hebrews 1, 2, that alludes to some of this and gives some other perspective. Romans 8, 32. Romans 4, 13 to 17, Galatians 3, 29, Revelations 21, verses 6 to 8. Um, I want to specifically read Revelations 21, 6 to 8, LITV version also. Um, and he said to me, it is done. Um, you know, that reminds me of what Christ said. It is finished, right? But here, what is being said is it is done, right? It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the ending. To the one thirsting, I will freely give of the fountain of the water of life. Remember that water of life that was flowing from the throne that John saw earlier on in Revelation? That fountain of life. The one overcoming will inherit all things and I will be God to him. Emphasis, the one overcoming will inherit all things. What things? The things that have been released into into him, into Christ for his inheritance. So verse 7, I'll start again. The one overcoming will inherit all things and I will be God to him and he will be the son to me. Verse 8, but for the cowardly and unbelieving and those having become foul and murderers and fornicators and sorcerers and idolaters, and all the lying ones, their part will be in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And what I'm really just emphasizing here is the ones overcoming, the ones mature enough to overcome all things would inherit all things. That is, they will co-inherit with Christ all things that he is inheriting. And yeah, so a um, couple of points or a couple of themes here is obedience, 
um, when it comes to why we must become sons of God. Obedience is critical. We have scripture here, Luke 15, 11 to 32, Psalms 32, verse 8. Obviously, Joshua 1, where we see the Lord speaking to Joshua about being obedient to the things that have been revealed. Also, releasing into glory, John 17 comes up again. Christ talks about it, John 17, 24, Romans 8, 21, which we just read. Um, sorry, did we read it? Yes, it was in the scriptures we read earlier on just now in Romans 8, 21, about releasing into glory and obviously inheritance, you know. So obedience, releasing into glory and inheritance. So inheritance, we look at Matthew 25, 34 and Revelation 21, 7 again features um, here. And really, that's just a snapshot of why we must become sons of God. Like I said, there's, it's such a weighty topic, but I'm hoping that these things would allow us, will have our hearts stirred to understand the importance of the dispensation of sons. And, you know, one more thing on that is, you know, the dispensation of sons is not a new thing, you know. And sometimes we, oh yeah, this new concept, it's not a new concept. Um, it's a concept that was in the New Testament with the early church. A lot of it didn't manifest fully, but I can actually show us that if you go all the way back to the beginning, in the Old Covenant, when the Old Covenant was instituted, but even prior to the Old Covenant, right, in the time of Abraham, Abraham matured into being a son. There was no covenant. It was a one-on-one -on -one thing. God had always been giving these types of symbols to show what was possible. Every time, throughout every era, God was always trying to reveal his heart to men through certain men. That Listen, this is what is possible. This is where I'm going for. So Abraham lived one a life like that where he affected all of creation and he still does where everyone can trace themselves either through faith or through lineage to Abraham as their father. You know, Abraham was so wealthy. Abraham delivered nations. You know, let's get this right. You know, the dispensation of sons affects things physically in your environment you know five kings came to attack Sodom and Gomorrah yes you know of which some of them were from the area Ur of the Chaldees they were close to that I mean do some research do your research and um, it states that they were from the region he came from um, it goes even further I believe that some of them were possibly even Nephilim at least one of them might have had Nephilim lineage but that's a different conversation but Abraham actually delivered Sodom and Gomorrah from five kings that came to attack them. He, the Bible says he took servants born in his household. Not all his servants, just the one men that were born in his household and he went, he led them. He didn't tell them, oh, go get the family back, go deliver the kings. He led the people, Abraham, led the people. There's no way it tells us that Abraham is a warrior, but through the scripture, we see that Abraham was actually a warrior. He took a sword, he was able to fight. He led people. To, and he delivered the kings, right? So he affected the dispensation of sonship he walked in, affected a whole nation, right? We see it in David too. We see it in Enoch. We see it in scripture, you know, just Noah himself, Noah. We see it in Job, right? Job was wealthy. He, was, he had farms. He had businesses. He had animals. He was running tons of businesses, right? You know, he affected his community. He was known by the leaders in society, um, you know, so when you walk in sonship, right, and one of the reasons we're trying to highlight this, the dispensation of sons, is not only does it affect you spiritually and your soul, but it's also going to have a toll on your body, which directly would influence your environment and where God is calling you to. So, um, and that's the last point I wanted to talk about here. I hope this was helpful in understanding, in beginning to understand some more about the dispensation of sons. And um, before we close, I want us to have another discussion, another discussion point. So this will be put up on the screen again. And what I want us to do with this is, is just to really begin to imagine and look in our own lives and in our own spheres, our own personal spheres. Don't compare yourself with anyone. Just in your personal sphere, you know, what does a mature son of God look like in your life, right? And in your generation. It's something I want each of us. It doesn't matter whether you're 10 or whether you're... 85 or 100, it really doesn't matter, right? Whether you're 10 or whether you're 100, it doesn't matter. I'd like us to take this time, and I really want everyone in the groups to really engage and participate in this particular discussion group, to understand and to experience, and I want everyone to be able to share amongst themselves what they think about that. So we're gonna have that slide put up, the questions, and just, I'd like us to just work through that, and um, yeah, feel free to employ the tools you need to 
enable you to do this. Um, and I'll come back and I'll close off just in a couple of minutes. So please spend 10 minutes doing that and we'll be right back. Thank you. I hope you had a fantastic time with that discussion. I hope there are tons of jokes. I hope everybody was able to identify what a mature son of God would look like in their life and in their environment. Um, I'm sure everyone has tons of stories and I'm sure there were tons of jokes. And, you know, we're using these discussion groups to really drive home these things from our own perspectives. I want everyone to be able to see themselves. You know, not just that, we're not just trying to just teach and give you information. It's got to be something that can be, that must be in Bible. Like Matthew 13 says, and like Christ shared the parable, you understand that the heart in which the seed was sown, the good heart, which understood. We really need people to understand. The Lord needs, you know, that's something Paul did a lot. The more I read the letters of Paul to Galatia, to the church in Rome, to the ch church in Ephesus, to the churches in Corinth, right? And the more I read it, the more I realize that Paul just began to discover that understanding was required in the body, in the assembly, in the ecclesia as they were growing. And it's sad to say that a lot, of, a lot of things, people do not understand exactly God's perspective anymore. And what we're trying to do here is to get us to return to understand. There's no point building if you don't understand. There's no point building if you don't understand the blueprint the Lord wants for this time. There's no point building if you don't understand who you are. There's no point going out to do anything if you don't know fully that you are a son of God. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate everyone listening and I hope you guys have had fun in the session. And um, hopefully we get to speak to each other again and we get to see each other soon. Thank you. Have a great day. This is the place.